Related Research Rollo May's existential theory has been moderately influential as a method of psychotherapy, but it has sparked almost no direct empirical research. This state of affairs is no doubt related to the critical stance that May adopted toward objective and quantitative measurement. Any theory that emphasizes the connection between subject and object and the uniqueness of each individual will not be conducive to large sample research with experimental or questionnaire design. In fact, May argued that modern science is too rationalistic, too objective, and that a new science is needed in order to grasp the total, living person. One existential topic to receive some empirical attention has been existential anxiety. May I find anxiety as the apprehension cued off by a threat to some value which the individual holds essential to his or her existence as a self. When events threaten our physical or psychological existence, we experience existential anxiety, and strongest among the threats to our existence is death. Indeed, May and Yalem argued that a major developmental task is to deal with the terror of obliteration. In a sense, life is the process of coping with and confronting death. An existential approach to the study of terror and death has carried over into terror management, a modem experimental offshoot of existential psychology. A conceptual bridge between existential psychology and terror management theory was provided by the American psychiatrist Emus Becker, who was inspired by Kierkegaard and Otto Rank. A basic argument of these existentialists, as well as writers such as Camus and Sartre, is that humans are first and foremost motivated by fear of death. Moreover, many of these thinkers see human creativity, culture, and meaning as unconscious defenses against mortality. The work of Becker, in particular, has been a major source of inspiration for terror management theorists. Mortality Salience and Denial of Our Animal Nature Terror management theory has taken this basic assumption and tested it by conducting some of the more clever and well-designed experimental studies in recent social and personality psychology. Although humans are part of the animal kingdom and hence mortal, they are unique in understanding of the world and unique in realizing their own uniqueness. Humans have long believed that they are more than just bodies they have a soul, a spirit, a mind. Over the centuries, humans have learned to disarrow their corporeal selves. For example, bodily functions continue to be among the most taboo and heavily sanctioned of social norms. To be cultured is to be in complete control of the biological nature of being human. According to terror management theorists, the crux of the denial of our bodily and animalistic nature stems from the existential fear of death and decay of our bodies. As Sheldon Solomon and colleagues put it, humans could not function with equanimity if they believed they were not inherently more significant than apes, lizards, and lima beans. Jamie Goldenberg and colleagues conducted a two-part study to investigate the extent to which mortality salience would lead to greater denial of our animal nature. More specifically, they reasoned, cultures promote norms to help distinguish themselves from animals, because this distinction provides the very important psychological function of providing protection against deeply rooted concerns about mortality. Culture, from this perspective, is the mechanism through which awareness of death is regulated. More specifically, cultural worldviews, religion, politics, and social norms, and self-esteem function to defend against thoughts of death, so that when death becomes salient through disasters, death of a loved one, or images of death, people respond by clinging more closely to cultural worldviews and bolstering their self-esteem. They do this, for instance, by becoming more patriotic, clinging more firmly to one's in-group more, or by wanting to punish more harshly those who violate cultural norms and laws. In addition, in the emotion of disgust, we see most clearly the cultural defenses against our animal nature. Anything that reminds us of our animal nature, and ultimately of death, is responded to with a strong sense of disgust. In study 1, Goldenberg, we're interested in the opposite effect, does increasing death awareness increase the disgust reaction? In addition, they wondered whether the effect would increase after a delay or distraction because the thoughts of death would be less conscious. To test the prediction that death awareness would increase feelings of disgust and that the effect would increase as it became less conscious, 
they manipulated death salience in university students. The outcome variable for the study was how much discussed participants expressed on a questionnaire. The independent variables were whether one's own mortality was made salient or not and whether there was a delay in the discussed measure or not. Disgust was measured by the disgust sensitivity scale, without its death subscale. Responses were made on a 9-point Likert scale, and example items included statements such as you see maggots on a piece of meat in an outside garbage pail, if I see someone vomit, it makes me sick to my stomach, and it would bother me. Thoughts of death were made salient by asking participants to write down the feelings that thoughts of their own death aroused in them. They were also asked to write down what they think will happen to them when they physically die. The neutral, non-salient, condition simply had participants write down what they would feel watching TV. Delay was manipulated by including a word game that took five minutes to complete for half of the participants. In the delay condition, participants wrote down thoughts, about death or TV, completed the word game, and then completed the discussed measure. In the immediate condition, the word game preceded the writing about death task. Results of the manipulation supported the hypothesis. Disgust reactions were greatest after death had been made salient and even more so when there was a delay between mortality salience and disgust evaluations. Participants in the neutral, TV, and delay condition showed the same level of disgust as the participants in the death salience and immediate condition. Goldenberg and colleagues interpreted these results as support for the basic terror management assumption that people distance themselves from animals because animals remind us of our own physical bodies and death. In a second related study, Goldenberg and colleagues reasoned that if being an animal is threatening to humans because it reminds them of their death, then being reminded of one's death should make one less sympathetic to arguments that we are a part of the animal kingdom and simply another kind of animal. In order to test this hypothesis, they assigned undergraduates to one of two mortality salience conditions, salience or neutral, and then had them evaluate one of two kinds of essays, humans as animals or humans as distinct from animals, resulting in a 2x2 design. Mortality salience was manipulated in the same manner as in study 1, with participants being asked to write down their feelings about their own death and what happens to them physically after they die. The neutral condition had students write down their thoughts and feelings about undergoing a mildly painful dental procedure. In both cases, other measures were administered immediately following these essays to provide a delay condition. The essays were described as coming from an honors student at a local university, and each was labeled the most important thing that I have learned about human nature. The Humans as Animals essay was written in the style of modern-day Darwinian theory, and the humans as distinct from animals was written in the style of humanistic theory. Participants were told that they were randomly assigned an essay and were to evaluate it on six questions with Likert scale response options such as how intelligent do you believe this person to be is, or how much do you agree with this person's opinion. Results revealed a main effect on essay type, with students being most favorable toward the humans as unique essay. There was, however, an interaction effect, in the neutral condition, that is, the two essays were rated equally favorably, wherein the death salient condition, the humans as unique essay was rated significantly more favorably than the humans as animals essay. The results of this study confirm the human need to distinguish themselves from animals. In addition, it also suggests that this effect is due to mortality salience itself and not any painful experience. The authors suggested that not all cultures are equally invested in denying the animal nature of humans and that some are much more at home in their bodies and animal nature. Nevertheless, even if specific to certain cultures, and even if the behaviors that distinguish us from animals serve other functions as well, the present work suggests that such distancing plays a role in human defense against death. Fitness as a defense against mortality awareness. If thoughts of death are so anxiety-provoking and defended against, as most every study on terror management has demonstrated, one might think it obvious that if reminded of their mortality, people would then be motivated to do things that decrease the likelihood of dying. Such as perform healthy behaviors like exercising. Surprisingly, however, 
to date no research has examined mortality salience on intentions to undertake health-conscious behaviors. As implied in the first study, terror management theory actively argues for two distinct categories of defense against death, namely conscious and unconscious. The conscious defenses are also referred to as proximal defenses and take the form of not me, not now and are seen in active suppression of thoughts of death as well as distancing and denying one's vulnerability. When one's death is unconsciously activated, then distal defenses become activated. These involve identifying with and defending cultural beliefs and ideologies and boosting one's self-esteem. With the distinction between proximal and distal defenses as a guide, Jamie Arndt, Jeff Skimmel, and Jamie Goldenberg reasoned that intention to exercise should be an ideal avenue to study the different effects of both kinds of defense. The intention to exercise is obviously a proximal defense in that people are motivated by the desire to be healthy and avoid disease. It is also a distal defense in that it bolsters self-esteem and body image. In support of this reasoning, health and appearance are often the first and second reasons given in surveys on why people decide to exercise. The study by Arndt and colleagues examined the prediction that mortality salience should therefore increase both reasons for wanting to exercise, namely increasing fitness and looking better, self-esteem. More specifically, study 1 examined the proximal defense theory, no delay, of exercise, and study 2 examined a combination of proximal and distal, delay, defenses. Both studies also recruited participants for whom exercise was important to their self-esteem and participants for whom it was not important. Study 1 was a 2x2 design, with two levels of mortality salience, mortality versus dental pain, and two levels of fitness self-esteem. Participants were university students, 64% female, who were told they were participating in a study on the relationship between personality and fitness. They were given a packet of questionnaires to complete, which included the same mortality salience versus dental procedure discussed earlier in study 2 of Goldenberg. All participants then read a brief article on how exercise promotes longevity and then completed two questions about their intention to exercise. The first was how much they will exercise relative to their own norm over the next month, and the second was how long, 30 to 160 minutes, their next exercise will be. Responses to these two questions were standardized and added together to create an overall measure of intention to exercise. Results showed that mortality salience did immediately increase intention to exercise relative to the painful dental procedure condition. Fitness self-esteem also was not related to intention to exercise. The 2x2 interaction between mortality salience and fitness self-esteem, contrary to prediction, was also not significant. The authors suggested that the two non-significant findings may be the result of everyone getting the information on the health benefits of exercise and thereby making the intention to exercise the socially desirable response. By delaying the fitness intention measure after mortality salience, the fitness as a source of self-esteem should affect the intention to exercise. Study 2 was conducted to test this idea and had the same design as study 1, two levels of mortality salience and two levels of fitness self-esteem. But it also had an additional factor of immediacy, participants either assessed their fitness intentions immediately after the mortality salience manipulation or after a brief delay. Therefore, the second study was a replication and extension of the first and resulted in a 2x2x2 design. Participants again were university students, 50% female. The main difference in procedures and measures from study 1 was the inclusion of a filler reading task, five mundane pages from a work by Camus that had no reference to death or other existential issues, for the delay group. In other words, after the mortality salience or dental procedure manipulation, participants either read the Camus passage, delay group, or immediately answered the more elaborate fitness intention questionnaire, consisting of nine rather than two questions. After a factor analysis revealed two of the nine fitness intention questions did not cohere with the others, a final seven-item scale was constructed by standardizing and summing responses to the seven questions. Another difference between the two studies was that no participants were primed by reading about how exercise increases longevity. 
Results of the first study were replicated, in the immediate group only, mortality salience led to greater desire for exercise compared to the painful dental procedure. In the second study, however, there was an overall main effect for fitness self-esteem, with participants for whom fitness is important to their overall self-esteem intending to do more exercise following mortality salience than those for whom it was not so important. In addition, again there was a main effect for mortality salience, regardless of immediacy condition, those who were made aware of their mortality intended to do more exercise than those who were made to think about undergoing a painful dental procedure. Immediacy also had an overall main effect, with those who delayed answering questions about their fitness intentions claiming they would exercise more than those who immediately responded. Finally, an interaction was found such that fitness intentions increased after mortality salience only for those participants for whom fitness was an important source of their self-esteem. Overall, the results of these two studies confirm the importance of distinguishing between proximal, conscious, and distal, unconscious, defenses against death. They also confirm the idea that people may well be motivated to undertake behaviors that fight against death and disease, namely, exercise, when their own mortality is made salient, especially if exercise is a relevant and important source of their self-esteem. In summary, terror management seems to bolster the fundamental principle of existential psychology that both conscious and unconscious anxiety provoked by thoughts of death is a powerful force behind much of human behavior.